He's known literally throughout the universe for his groundbreaking discoveries in the field of string theory. He co-invented mirror symmetry, and he brought the notion of Kalabi Yao manifolds to the mainstream. Meet the one and only Brian Greene. Brian's a professor of physics and math at Columbia University and the author of numerous best-selling books. Join us on this in-person conversation held late at night at Columbia University as we uncover the hidden reality of our universe and delve into parallel universes and the deep mysteries of the fabric of reality. Let's go. So welcome back, everybody. You're here with the extended overtime with a uh, brilliant, inspiring mentor to millions around the world, Brian Green, and yours truly, Brian Keating. And I love to ask these questions that humanize scientists. And I think mm. you do a wonderful job, you and Tracy and your whole team at the World Science Festival, of showing scientists as human beings. And there's this, you know, kind of trope that we're just these monotonous robots who, you know, can only tell a scientist is outgoing. Do you know how to tell if a scientist is outgoing or not? No, how do you do it? Uh, when he looks at your shoes, <laughs> when he talks. To, uh, so that's Good. that's an old one. But, um, but I like to humanize. You've been, you've done so much stuff. There's no shortage of humanization for a wonderful person such as yourself. But I love to ask these questions to get to kind of the the uh, soul of hidden reality, to to use a phrase that you uh, that you coined or twisted. They're all related in some way to Arthur C. Clarke, because the mm -hmm. name of this podcast, the Into the Impossible podcast, as you'll find out if you don't know, came from Sir Arthur C. Clarke's uh, sentiment. He was very quip worthy. And one of his quips was the only way of determining the limits of the possible is to go beyond them into the impossible. And so at UC San Diego, I'm the associate director of the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination. Yeah. Long-winded way to say that we're going to talk about all these different things related to Arthur C. Clarke. I assume you've seen 2001 A Space Odyssey. Not in a long time. <laughs> Me yes. neither, but yeah. yes. I saw it in 2001. Yeah. But in that movie, there are these strange things, these monoliths that open in the beginning of the movie. There are these baboon type things, yeah. there are hominids in the savannah of Africa hitting it with a bone, trying to crack it open. And then later on, they appear on the moon and they're floating around in space. We're not really sure what they are, these sentinels, as, as they're described in the book. And the question I kind of want to ask you about is if you had, uh, if these things were time capsules and you could put anything from the human, you know, collection of, of wisdom, knowledge, acquisition, and you could inscribe it or put it in there, put it on there for an alien civilization to find a billion years hence, what would it be? What would be sort of the crown jewel of humankind maybe maybe your work or, or you know what have you but but it could be I'm, I'm not saying that you would say that but but people have said that i mean Cumron said string theory uh <laughs> but i want to ask what would you put on it Feynman said the atomic hypothesis something that would be be you know betray or be speak of the swagger that human beings should have the confidence that we should have in our past accomplishments what would it be yeah i mean from the from the science point of view a competitor to Feynman's statement that the atomic hypothesis is you know, the most fundamental thing that, that we have discovered. The competitor, I would say, is that symmetry is the key to understanding the cosmos. And so I would be happy to have the gauge group of the standard model inscribed. Mm -hmm. I'd be happy to have the unifying groups that we discussed earlier, SU5, SU10, E6. I, I, I would want to have the Lorentz group included, you know, SU3-1. <laughs> so to me, symmetry is really the, the deep lesson that emerges over the last few hundred years. Now, having said that, that's just sort of on the science side of things. If you ask me what I would really want to put in there to capture the human spirit, I go in a direction that some of your listeners might be less pleased to hear me say. I think the most vital thing that we humans do is try to understand our place in a greater cosmic order. And there are many ways that we've tried to do that. Religion is one of those ways. Religion is not the answer to scientific questions, but does it wonderfully illustrate the deep urge that we have to feel part of something grander? I think that really does say something about us. So I'd want to include that. I want to include the great musical compositions that have that longing and that urgent sense of trying to understand the world from Brahms and Beethoven to Bach. I mean, there are so many 
deeply moving and poetic ways that again, we've tried to understand how we fit in. So yes, yeah, science is part of it, but the great movements, be it in music, be it in philosophy, be it in religion, I all feel that they're part of a human narrative that tries to say, here we are, these little beings crawling around the surface of this nondescript planet in the outskirts of this absolutely ordinary galaxy. And how do we make sense of that? And here are the various ways that we've gone about it. Wow. Oh, it's very uh, it's very serendipitous that you say that. I asked that of Andrurian, as I asked all my uh, guests that honor me by coming on. And I said, what would you put on a time capsule the last billion years? She said, oh, I did that. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> she did yeah. that Voyager Golden Record. That's Actually, right. what she put on it is harkens back to, it was the first example of ethno music, you know, world music, mm. put on samples from all these that's tribes. Yeah, and, right. and she also, they had her uh, EK, uh, EKG, no, ECG, uh, they scanned her brain, EEG, where they scanned right, her brain, right. and she was just had fallen in love with Carl. And so that's on a, a record flying, you know, <laughs> on its way to Proxima Centauri. The next kind of uh, call out, shout out to Sir Arthur C. Clarke is this famous phrase that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable magic. from magic. Yeah. So tell me, what technology, you're a theorist, but but what technology is most exciting to you that it, either in physics and science or could be in in you know, in the commercial sphere, AI, it could be. Anything. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I, it's not particularly originally just mentioned. I would say that AI. At, at Have the you moment, played around with it? Or? I, I've played around with it. We did actually a, a program at the World Science Festival in September on it, which will be come out at some point. And in order to familiarize myself more fully, I actually went back to some of the original papers, learned about neural nets, learned about transformer architectures, kind of wanted to understand the, the basis of it all. Number one, what I found is mathematically, it is really straightforward. Yeah. Incredibly Spectre, trivial and yeah, straightforward. You know? right? and, and number <laughs> two, outcome. number two, what it really does highlight is when you have sufficiently large data sets that of course you have to analyze in the yeah. right way, when you have patterns of patterns of patterns of patterns of patterns of patterns of words, that hierarchy of patterns yields behaviors and insights that feel very human. They're not human, right. but they feel really human. And there's something deeply compelling and also to some deeply frightening. I just give you one little yeah. example that really kind of caught my attention. We discussed it a bit in this program. I, I wanted to see how one of these large language models deals with information that's false because that's obviously something that we're all worried about yeah. you know misinformation deep fakes and so forth and i said to the system if i told you that seven times eight is 62 not 56 how would you make sense of it and the system came back with five explanations but two of them were particularly interesting the first one was maybe you're working in a different base not base 10 and indeed i was i was working in base nine and it worked it out that i thought was like pretty creative okay Number two, it said, maybe it's metaphorical. I was like, that's interesting. Can you expand on that? And the system said, yes. Imagine there's a land called Numeralia in which seven represents truth and eight represents friendship. And 62 represents the deep bond between people that share truth and friendship. So when people get together, they exchange tokens, it said, a seven and an eight, and that puts them together in this union called 62. And I looked at this thing, I, I, I know it's not a human, I know it's not intelligent in the way that we normally think about intelligence as a human being, but it was really kind of an amazing moment. So it feels to me, that we may be at one of those rare inflection points where things really change. I, I love AI, especially when it hallucinates, because I'll ask it, who is Brian Keating? And I'll say, Brian Keating is a cosmologist, check. Uh, University of California, San Diego, check. He's the author of Losing the Nobel Prize, check. Into the Impossible, check. The Elegant Universe. <laughs> yeah, so I, my book sales go up and, I, and my Amazon ranking seems high. Um, but actually, I think about, and maybe just a quick diversion, you know, when you think about um, what Einstein called his happiest thought, the thought yeah. that gave him heart palpitation. Yeah. What was the Einstein equivalence principle that an observer in free fall would uh, experience no gravitational field? I'm like, I mean, the tail wagging the dog. You, you don't need me to teach it, but but that was what he said. Now, I ask you, Brian, to what extent could a computer have a happy thought? Could it 
view and, and value embodiment and visceral sensation. I've had Noam Chomsky on, he believes it's not possible that you, there's something about the visceral nature of the human body that leads to generative intelligence of a true nature, like creating the Einstein equivalence principle. Do you think we'll have, you know, AI, AE, artificial intelligent Albert Einsteins, or do you think they'll just kind of supplement, maybe they can retrodict, but they won't be able to predict new laws of physics? No, I, I, unlike Noam Chomsky, I really don't think there's any special about the substrate called the human body or even the human brain. I, again, don't know, but my suspicion is that if you have a sufficiently powerful computational system, along with that computational power comes a certain kind of conscious sensation. Mm -hmm. So I really don't see consciousness as something special that's added on top or needs a body or needs flesh and blood. I see it as something that goes hand in hand with a certain depth of computational capacity. So I really do think we'll have artificial systems that have sensations. And that truly are feeling them. And look, it's very difficult to check that. <laughs> yeah. I don't even know if you're having real sensations. I think you are based upon my understanding and my theory of mind. And every piece of data suggests that we're very similar in terms of, roughly speaking, the Can't kinds of experiences. Office. Right. It's not but, a uh, but, but, you know, when it comes to a, a system, an artificial system, it'll be very hard to check it, just like it's hard to check for you. But if that system is crying and really tells me it's depressed and explains to me why it's depressed. Circuit for it. You know, um, I blew I, a capacitor. I think it'll be pretty convincing, <laughs> you know? I used to drop on my former department chair, Dmitry Basov. I used to drop on him the following quip from Sir Arthur. Uh, he used to say, for every expert, there's an equal and opposite expert. Um, so whenever Dimitri would give me too many community assignments, mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, I hope you'll give him my best when you see him. He's my chair too, by the way, just everybody now <laughs> knows. I stole yes. him away. Yes. This is a guy who told me that we hired you, Brian, because uh, we think you win a Nobel Prize someday. And I and I didn't know who he was at the time, but you know, it was early on in my career. And I looked up, uh, who's Nikolai Basov? You know, uh, look up who that is. Uh, that was his dad. That's oh, an uh, co-inventor of the laser. Well, I didn't right? know. Along with a former oh, dentist in this building, Charlie Pounds. Oh, yeah. And no, so there's a Charlie. deep connection wow. between Columbia and, wow, uh, and the laser. Anyway, yeah. amazing. The quote that I want to turn to now is the following Sir Arthur said, When an elder, um, God forbid, Hasta Shalom, I'm calling you elderly, but when an elderly but distinguished scientist says something is possible, he is very likely to be right. But when he says something is impossible, he's very likely wrong. I want to ask you, Brian, what have you been wrong about, if anything? What have you changed your mind about? What would you like a mulligan over? I, for instance, never thought that we would have a real proposal for the foundational equations of string theory by today. And because of this work that goes by the name of duality and ADF-CFT correspondence, we're really close to that, at least in certain circumstances. And so that to me was something that was like a hundred or 200 years off mm. back say in the eighties and early nineties and was completely wrong mm. on that front. Gravitational waves. When I'd hear people talk about <laughs> building gravitational wave detectors, I couldn't help but laugh. It's impossible. You know, right? back in the eighties and nineties, it was just impossible. You will never be able to do this thing, you know? And, and yet, you know, we now have direct 2015. So it didn't even take 100 <laughs> years, right? It just took, you know, 20 years from the time that I thought it would be impossible. So yes, I'm continually amazed by what my colleagues are able to do. And you're right. I mean, you basically need to tell the right experimenter that something's impossible. And then 20 years later, they'll oh, do, God, it. do it. Yeah. yeah. All right, Brian, the last question harkens back to the name of this podcast, the Into the Impossible podcast. And as I said before, the statement by Sir Arthur is kind of evocative to me of sort of advice to your former self. And the statement goes like this. It said, the only way of determining the limits of what's possible is to go beyond those limits into the impossible. That's the name of my podcast. I want to ask you in the form of advice to 20-year-old Brian. Now we're going back in time instead of forward in time. Billions of years. Now we're going back 20, 30, 40 years. And that is the following. What would you say to a 20-year-old Brian 
you have 30 seconds with him to give him the courage to do as you've done, to go into the impossible, to remove the unknown and take away that anxiety about the future, perhaps. What and this could be not in physics. Yeah. This could be in life. It could be, you know, buy Bitcoin, whatever you want. What advice would you give to this young Brian to give him the courage to do as you've done to go into the impossible? Yeah, I guess I would say be willing to take deep chances. I think in my career, I've definitely taken chances. I've worked on things that were highly speculative that perhaps wouldn't work out. And some of them did, some of them didn't. But if I was to go back, the thing that I'd want to change is to be even more bold and be willing to be that much more wrong and be willing to have complete failure. (laughs) And I don't think there are many times that I wasn't willing to have complete failure. I'd be working on things that were difficult and hard, but I could sort of see a trajectory toward the finish line. And when you look at some of the scientists who have really changed everything, many of them were working on something that nobody would go near because it just seemed beyond the reach of a human being, at least at this particular point in our understanding. Mm. And, you know, the problem with that, of course, is most of the time people who take that advice will fail. Rarely, however, they will succeed. And it feels to me that it's worth that chance. And I think I'm going to encourage at least a younger version of myself to go for it even more than perhaps I actually did. Well, Professor Brian Green, uh, renowned just mentored in millions, literally. You've been mentoring two of my friends who are no longer in physics, were inspired, mentored by you remotely through your uh, phenomenal writing. And they asked me to send you uh, their gratitude as as I have benefited and so many around the world. And I don't want to uh, keep you up any longer with your list of accomplishments with Ryan Green. Thank you so much for spending a late night on a Monday night, coming back from wherever you had to come back from uh, to spend a little bit of time with my audience that is thirsty for your wisdom. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Very enjoyable. Thank you. It's great.